is the final call for our ticket sale for the fundraiser going on this Saturday. Three days away, two days away, three days. Oh, I'm so lost what day it is right now. But Saturday, Saturday is our fundraiser at 6 o'clock. Come excited, come ready, and just remember, this is going to be a fun night. It's going to be filled with food, games, just talking and being with friends and family. But most importantly, this is about the kids. This is all for the kids. That's why we're doing this night. It's to help them do their best for this Christmas program. Do their best and do it all for God. So come ready to give your best Saturday night for those kids, okay? Uh, tonight, again, last call for tickets, $50 per couple, $25 per person, okay? Um, another, the anniversary banquet. That's coming up November 13th. So get excited about that. Invite people. It's going to be a great, great, great time. It always is. Dave Harris will be here, and you don't want to miss it. All right? And then we have the Women's Christmas Brunch, br lunch brunch, at Tecumseh Tea House on uh, December 4th. So the first Saturday in December, remember to buy your tickets as soon as you can because it is limited seating. So um, so see Monica or uh, what you're paying up at the screen there. We'll have something on there for the woman's brunch and invite friends to that too, okay? It's all about fellowship, getting together, and just all for God's glory. Amen. All right, so let's get our tithes and offering together. Lots of exciting things happening in these few months here at Cornerstone, and we're all excited just because we love Jesus. I know everyone here in this room loves Jesus, and all of this is to glorify him. Same thing with your tithes and offering. This is a time to glorify him, to honor him, give back what he rightfully deserves. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you so much for your love and your mercy and your grace, Father. Thank you that you are so good to us, sometimes when we don't even deserve it. And thank you, Father, for everything you've given us. We recognize that we would have nothing without you, Lord. You give us everything we need and some of the things we want, Father, and we are so grateful. So, Lord, it is an honor to give back to you tonight, Father. So use it, Lord. Use it for what you want it to be used for. We give you all the praise and glory tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
So hope for the hopeful. Monica, that is so right on the money. Because if there's anybody else that is um, feeling like, you you know, it's hopeless, that I just want to give up. I just want to walk away. I just want to do something else because I feel so hopeless. And that is the furthest thing from Jesus. Jesus loves us. Can you get that through? Can we get that through our heads? He loves us. And because he loves us, we have hope. Because he loves us, there is a bright future ahead of us. Irregardless of what happens in this society, what happens in this country, we have a bright future. And Jesus is not going to compromise on that one bit. Amen? Okay. 
because I got I got to bear my soul here a little bit. Sometimes I feel like, my God, Chuck, is anything you're doing making a difference? Yeah. And he just straight, and I know that gets on you. And I'm telling you, Bill, it's it makes a difference, a big difference to many different people. And, and the rest of us, we can say that too, okay? I love you enough to tell you and encourage you that Jesus has a bright future for us. Amen. You know, I was <clears throat> I went to the gas station yesterday, and I actually have not been in the Shell gas station in a while. I was on that side of town, and I pulled into the Shell gas station and uh, just pulled up to the pump and was standing at the pump, putting my debit card in, trying to put in my information, and a, a lady came up to me. Uh, while I'm standing there, she came up to me, and she just said, excuse me sir I was wondering if you could help us she said we're really struggling and um, we don't have enough gas in our vehicle and you could tell that she had been without if I could just leave it at that for a while and she kind of looked she said to me I'm on my way to a job interview but she wasn't can you help us? And she and she says to me, she said, I, I you know, I, I can I can give you a pop or something. And I got the impression that she had an EBT card or something that wasn't working at the pump, but she could give me some food or something. She was trying to t get me to put some few bucks in her car, and she said, I'll give you a, a pop and a sandwich out of inside or something. And I said, well, I don't I don't need a pop, but I said, you know, are you at a pump? Because I wasn't just going to give her cash. I was like, are you at a pump? I'll put my card in and I'll put some gas in your car. And she was. The, the car she was in was parked right up against the gas station. She said, we're right there. I'll tell them to pull around. And I said, okay, I'll finish up here and I'll, I'll meet you over there. And I hear the car start and all they're trying to do is do a U-turn from the building to the gas pump and it dies halfway. That's how far out of gas they were. They moved like 20 feet and the car died. So, so now I'm pushing the car. <laughs> It's a Dodge Durango. It's not a light vehicle. It's full of all their stuff. So now I'm pushing their car to the gas pump. And uh, I just walk up, and I just swipe my card, and I do the thing, and I start pumping her, pumping her gas, and, and she's, she's standing next to me, and I, I had grabbed an invite out of my door. And I said, well, you're invited. And she just kind of, like, didn't really put much value in that at first. And I said... I said, well, you're invited. We'd love to see you here. You're always welcome. And I said, we're just going to go ahead and just let this go. We'll just fill it up. And I started just chatting with her. She said, you're just going to fill it up? I said, yeah. You, you, you said you needed some help. I said, let's just I said, let's get crazy. Let's just fill it up. <laughs> and she started bawling. And and she she bear hugs me. Like, and won't let go. Bawling. Nobody's nice to us. What do you What do you mean? What do you What do you mean? You're just gonna fill it up? Nobody's nice to us. Why are you being nice to us? I said. You said you needed some help, right? She finally lets go, and I finish. You know, I put the pump away, and I I walk up to the driver's door. The window's down, and the the gentleman's there who was steering as we were pushing him. He's this big burly dude, big beard, man, manly man, and he's bawling. She's back in the vehicle by this time, and I just felt impressed. I said, listen, I, I know it seems hard in this moment, but I just feel, listen, just don't quit. And he starts crying harder. 
I, you got to keep going, sir. Listen, I don't know your, your whole circumstance, but I'm just telling you that I, I know it seems rough right now, and, I, and I've been in some low places myself, but I'm telling you this is not the end. Keep going. Keep going. Don't quit. This is what I'm saying to him. Don't quit. Keep going. Keep going. And the more I'm talking, the more he's crying. And the more I'm talking, I'm looking in their vehicle, and clearly they've been living out of this vehicle. I really do feel like he was suicidal. You know, you're talking about hope. I feel like they were at the last straw of hopelessness. I mean, 75 bucks of gas to give you a little bit of hope to where you don't end it is nothing. Sir, please don't quit. Just keep going. I know it's tough right now and you might not see a way out, but I'm begging you, please, just keep going. Don't quit. He said, we've been living out of our vehicle. It's just tough. I said, I know. And he's like, thanks to you, at least we'll have some heat tonight. I'm just, I, listen, I'm just telling you, don't quit. I said, do you have some food? I was going to take him over to Aldi's and buy a bunch of food or something. Do you have food? They said, well, we have some food. We just don't have a place to stay. We've been living out of our car. Don't quit. I said, there's a number at the bottom of that card. If we can help in any way, we'll do our best. There's a website there you can... Put in a prayer request or something. Just don't quit. And I walked away from that moment really feeling like I didn't know what else to do, but feeling like I didn't do enough. Later that day, somebody called. And I don't know for sure if it was the same person, but I think it might have been. And they were, you know, they just called the church. And I get these phone calls often. And they're never easy. As, you know, as many of the years as we've answered phone calls, it's, it's not got easier. We're living in a car. Can you put us in a hotel room for a couple of nights? It's cold. We're supposed to, you know, my husband's supposed to get his SSI check on Monday. Can you give us a couple of days? Help us out. I said, ma'am, I'm just going to tell you, we support this ministry and we support this ministry monthly out of our budget. We give to this ministry and this ministry and this ministry. That's what they do. Here's their phone number. I said, in today's society, honestly, if I answered, if I, if I paid everybody's rent that called here every week, I wouldn't be able to keep my own lights on. Everybody's looking for help right now. But this is what, you know, and I prayed. Now in this season, in this time, we cannot get hopeless. You know, faith is a substance of things to hope for. <laughs> you need to get some hope back. You need to get some hope back. You are good enough. Jesus Christ died to give you his very best, and I think it's time we start living like that. But I want to encourage you with that story there, I guess, just to make sure that you're staying open to the Holy Ghost through the week, because you never know. I don't go to Shell Gas Station normally. I'm on this side of town. Whatever, I'll get some gas. Was that just the case? Or did I just save somebody from committing suicide? I mean, I really don't know. I'm just encouraging you to be open to what the Holy Ghost is, is saying to you daily, where you literally get out of bed in the morning and say, Father, I'm yours to command today. Speak to me. Holy Spirit, literally speak to me today. Speak through me today. If there's some way that I can be used by, by you, Father, I yield myself to you. Help me make a difference today in some way. And I really do believe that in that place, in that place of surrender, that you're going to find yourself being used in ways that you might not even know about until the day we're in heaven. The full ramifications of what you're doing. Is that okay? Just keep going. <laughs> And no matter how dark or dim it may seem in this moment that you're in, I'm encouraging you to keep going. When you're in these moments where you just, don't, you just don't know what to do or you're not seeing a way out, just follow peace. Follow God, don't quit. Amen? You receive it today? All right, come on. Give somebody some love before you sit down.
All right. Good evening, everybody. I don't know why I'm moving this. It was already in the middle. <laughs> Matthew 26. Not my message, just some, something I'm going to throw in. Is that, that's all right. Hopefully I have enough time to throw this in and do this, but, you know, whatever. Matthew 26. Um, Bob was actually teaching. Is Bob in here? There he is. Hi. No, I don't need you up here. I was, just, I was about to talk about you. But now that, now that you're in here, I may not. <laughs> uh, Bob touched on Matthew 26 when he was teaching on communion, right? And I'm actually going right where he was because that's where the Lord started showing me this. In Matthew 26, 27, he took the cup and gave thanks, gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission. Say remission. Remission of sins. That is the Greek word, aphia. Remission is the Greek word, aphia. Now, when Bob said that, prior to, prior to when you were teaching on this, whenever I read that word remission, I substitu- substituted the word forgiveness. In fact, some Bibles actually translate it as forgiveness because that is a meaning of the word. It, it sometimes means forgiveness of sins. So if you read it that way, it fits. It's the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of of sins. But when when you said remission on Sunday, the Lord said, son, what does remission mean? And he was just talking about the English word remission. And immediately my mind goes to a disease. What does it mean when someone's in remission? It's getting better. It's going away. Right? So that's where I... I immediately went and I said, oh yeah, that's kind of cool, God, that that's, your sins are slowly starting. You're slowly turning a corner. <laughs> I said, I'm in remission. Yeah, that's actually what I said. Okay, that's cool. We're all in remission, God. I like that, right? But then he said, look it up. I said, well, okay. I looked it up and wouldn't you know it, right beside, parallel to the idea of forgiving sins, is this. If you go to Luke chapter 4, you're going to see two places in the same verse that this word aphia, remission, is used. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, Recovery of sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who are oppressed. Twice in there, the same word is used, aphia. Do you know which word it was? Liberty. It literally means to break someone out of jail. (laughs) And Jesus said, this is the blood of the new covenant given for the liberty of sin. God, that changes everything. Because what does his name mean? Jesus. It means God saves. The Lord saves. And when he was given his, when he was given the name Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, he says, Call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Not just forgive them, save them. I said, man, that's cool. So that's free. I thought that was cool. That might help somebody. <laughs> Set the captives free. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go do the same. He said, go preach the gospel to all the world, to every creature, right? Same gospel he said in Luke 4. Okay, Hebrews chapter 6. Let's jump into this. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. You ready for this? We've been talking about foundations, building your life, your spiritual life on the right foundation, Right? We've talked about it twice already. I don't have time to go back, and I'm not going to try to sneak that teaching into this one. <laughs> so if you don't, if you didn't catch those two, go back and find them on Facebook or on YouTube. Okay? Can you do that? But today we're going to jump into the second foundation, the second elementary school principle of Christianity. You ready for this? Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. That means maturity. That word perfection means maturity. Not laying again the foundation of, this is what we talked about last time, repentance from dead works and faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, 
of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So the next one we're going to talk about is in verse, I believe it's one. I took all my verse numbers out of this passage. Can you go back? Nope, two. Sorry. Baptisms. Say baptisms. The teaching of baptisms, right? This is an elementary principle. Everybody should have this settled in them. Now, first thing you notice, I want you to notice, is the last letter of the word. There is more than one. And if you've only had one, you're not done. There is actually, in the New Testament, three distinct baptisms mentioned in the, in the New Testament. And we're going to talk about them. All three of them have the same elements. The details are different, but the same principles apply to all three. There's five principles that apply to all three. There's a substance that you're dunked in, right? There is a repentance, which if you remember last time we talked, repentance means a change of mind, a realization that something you thought was wrong, right? So there is a substance you're go, you go in. There's a repentance. There's a death involved. There's faith. You're choosing to believe something. And then there's a resurrection. Something comes out that wasn't there before. All three have those same elements, okay? Now, water baptism, of course, is the easiest one to understand because it's physical. You can see it happen, okay? So we're going to jump there. We're going to start there, and we're going to use that as a pattern for the others. Is that okay? Because it's easy. Water baptism is an easy thing to understand. Hopefully, we're not going to take a lot of time there. And we don't have a tank, so not tonight, guys. Sorry. <laughs> All right, water baptism. Say water baptism. Matthew chapter, sorry, I should have let you do that first. <laughs> Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you, how many, whoa, who? Every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission. Ah, whoa, hey. Look at there. For the remission of sins, and you shall receive... You know, I did not know that was going to tie in right there. <laughs> and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Say, water baptism. Okay, so talking about those five elements, the substance, the repentance, the faith, the death, the resurrection. What's the substance? Hello. It's in the name. Water. Literally, you are submerged under and brought back out of water. Easy, right? It's crazy that the most basic thing about this is argued about. There are people who say, no, you don't dunk them underwater. <laughs> right? Isn't that silly? It, it, it seems like there, people will argue about anything they can. They'll say, well... What name are you using? <laughs> right? What name are you using? As if the baptism itself is salvation. It's not. Paul said, hey, God didn't even send me to baptize. He said that. First Corinthians, he said, he listed off a few names of the people in the Corinth that he baptized in water. He said, I baptized this person, I baptized this person. Maybe I did this one. I can't remember anybody else. This, this is literally, literally what he said. He said, I don't even remember if I did anybody else. God did not send me to baptize. Right? So this idea that you're not saved if you're not baptized a certain way is silly. Baptism is not a work for salvation. It's an answer to it. So you're not saved by baptism. You get baptized because you've been saved. Okay? So the formula of going under the water and coming up and what they say, that does not save you. Okay? All right? So, the substance is water. Matthew 3.16 says, When he had been baptized, Jesus, what? Came up from the water. Silly question. Why did he come up? Because he was down. <laughs> Easy, right? And I've seen people make the silliest explanations. I had a, a good Catholic guy that I used to talk to 
a lot at work. And I, I mentioned this, and he said, well, he knelt down, and it was poured over him. I said, where do you see that at? <laughs> he came up out of the water, right? Okay, and we'll find out later that the pattern doesn't fit any other way. You got to go under, okay? So the substance is clear. It's obvious. It's water, okay? The repentance. Remember what we talked about repentance. It's a change of mind, right? You thought one way, you realize you're wrong, and you think another way. The repentance involved in water baptism was you understand and you make a confession. My life before was a sinner. I was a sinner. Okay? It's not sorrow. It's not remorse, although it includes those. But if there's just sorrow and remorse, it doesn't do anything. That's not repentance. Judas was sorry. He did not repent. Peter repented, and he was sorry. <laughs> right? So the sorrow and the remorse is not alone. You have to change what you think. And somebody who says, man, my life's worthless. My life is trash. My life is messed up. Okay. That's a, that's a good starting point. Now what? Because if you just stay there, you're not repenting. Okay. Right. So the repentance is you're changing your mind about your life before you were not enough. The old you was a bad person. Some people, that's hard to admit. A lot of people, when some people, when they get born again, when they come to Jesus, they just have the idea that they're adding him to their life. Their life was pretty good. Maybe he can make it better. But that's not how this works. You've got to come to the realization that life before Christ was hopeless. Life before Christ, you had to die. <laughs> that had to go. It had to get out of here, right? So the repentance in water baptism was you changed your mind. You need him. You were a sinner. Say, I was a sinner. I was a sinner. Okay, now th this leads naturally to the third element, which is the death. That old Jew has to die. Okay? During baptism, you're recognizing that the old you died with Jesus. Romans chapter 6 verse 3 says this, 3 and 4. Don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, now this is talking about water baptism, were baptized into what? His what? Wait, I thought you were joined into his life. Well, not, not this part. This part is when you go under, you're dying. I said this once before. Jesus did not die so you could live. He died so you could die. The old you. You were united with his death in baptism. When you went under the water, you're representing going down to the grave. Right? Okay? Your Savior carried all the sin and all that shame with him to the grave, and in baptism, you join him there. Okay? It, the old Jew went under the water, and it did not come back up. So in baptism, you go down, something else comes up. Okay? So there it is, the... the third element. So the first element is the substance, which is water. Second element is the repentance. You were a sinner. Third is the death. The old you dies under there. The fourth part is the faith. What is it that you're believing when you go through this? Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is a declaration of faith. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, yep, I'm here, I am in the flesh. Right? We would not be here if we weren't in the flesh. But the life that we live in the flesh, now we live by faith who love, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The declaration of faith is this. Jesus, I believe that you took my sin 
and you forgave me. Simple, right? You believe that he took your sin, you believe that he freely forgives you, and you believe that he made you righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we could become what? Righteous. Righteous. So when you're going into this baptism, you're confessing by faith, I've been made righteous. I believe I am not that old man anymore. He's dead. Okay? So that brings us to the best part of all three of these baptisms, and that is the resurrection. Something comes up that was not there before. Just like something goes down that doesn't exist again. Something comes up brand, brand new, completely different. You ready for this? I think you might know where I'm going. 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. That's the down. All things have become new. That's the up. Right? Back to Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The resurrection power comes on the scene to make you able to live righteous. So in the baptism, the old unrighteous you dies. You declare by faith, I've been made righteous. And when you come up, the power of God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, comes inside of you to live righteous, to live out what you've already said you were. Does this make sense so far? This is, I, I mean, we've talked about this, right? We've talked about this several times. That's what grace is, the power to live right, the power to do what's right. And that power, according to Ephesians chapter, I, I didn't write this down, but it, where Paul says, you know, I, I think it's chapter 1. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to take our time. Are you guys all right with this? Yeah? Ephesians chapter 1. Yeah, there it is. Verse 18 is where we're going to start. Ephesians 1, 18. I know I'm throwing you off, Joe. You got it? All right. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is, here it is, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. And here is the level of power that comes into your life when you're born again. It is according to the working of his power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead comes in your body and gives you the power to do what's right. Do you think that's enough? Would it be enough to have his power that raised him from the dead living in you to live righteous? I mean, what else would you need? <laughs> right? Okay, so that is the resurrection. So you're baptized in water. You confess that you're a sinner. You die to your old self you believe that God made you righteous and when you're raised back up out of that water you are empowered with his resurrection power to live holy it's water baptism how about you I want to get baptized again <laughs> you, got, you, got, you get it so far that's simple that's pretty simple Water baptism is easy to understand because, like I said, it's physical. You get the actual physical picture of it, okay? Let's move on to something else. You ready for this? Did you know there's more than one? Baptisms. Did you know there's more than one? I'm trying to figure out how to start this. So we're going to talk about the next one, which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible talks about. Baptism 
in the Holy Spirit. John said this. Did not, didn't John the Baptist said this? He said, I'm baptizing you in water. Someone's coming after me who's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. You ever stopped to think about those words? Baptized in the Holy Spirit. Picturing water baptism. Now you're going to change that substance of water <laughs> with the Holy Spirit. Can you get that? Your spirit is literally being submerged into His. And a lot of people think that this is not a separate thing from being saved. There's a lot of good brothers and sisters out there who think that when they get saved, they have all the Holy Spirit they're ever going to get. And they don't need another experience. There is no actual separate experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're born again and baptized in the Holy Ghost at the same time. Have you ever heard somebody talk like that? They deny the idea of another experience in their Christian walk. They got it all the first time. Well, I want to tell you about 12 guys who followed Jesus for three years, right? When Jesus appeared to them after he was raised from the dead, they saw him, they believed that he died and rose from the dead. They had already confessed him as their Lord. According to Romans chapter 10, were they saved? What does Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 say? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Were they born again when they saw Jesus and they said, Lord, you're alive? Yes. Everybody say yes. Yes, they were. <laughs> okay. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus told these born-again believers who were saved, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Would you say that's a separate experience from salvation? Obviously. Right? Okay. Mark 1.8 says, I baptize you with water, John talking, but he, speaking of Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the substance is God himself, the Holy Spirit. The baptizer, incidentally, is Jesus, according to what John just said. Because I can't baptize the Spirit. I can't take your Spirit. And it doesn't work that way. I can pray with you, right? We can pray, we can lay hands, and, and according to Scripture, that happened. When that happened, people did receive the Spirit. But it, that's an act of faith. That's an act of contact right? But my hand going on your head is not sending your spirit into the Holy Ghost. Somebody's got to take hold of you and do that. Somebody with spiritual hands. You, you follow me? Okay. So in this, when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we got to talk about the distinction, if there is one, between being baptized in and the Holy Spirit coming on someone. Is there a distinction? Is there a difference? Well, in Acts 1-5, we already read it, Acts 1-5, Jesus said, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Say, baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's Acts 1-5. Three verses later, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Okay? So you got being baptized in, Three verses later, you've got Holy Spirit coming on. Is he talking about the same event? Jesus said, you're going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. What was he talking about? What was going to happen? Acts chapter 2, right? Day of Pentecost. Acts 1, 8, he said, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. What is he talking about? Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost. <laughs> okay, I, I, I don't mean to be technical here. But some people think there's a distinction. I want to show you there's not. It's the same event. Okay? In Acts chapter 8, 
No, I'm sorry. Chapter 10. Peter talking to Cornelius, Cornelius' house, preaching the gospel to the household of Cornelius, the family of Cornelius. In Acts 10, 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, what happened? The Holy Spirit fell on. Say, fell on. Okay? In verse, or chapter 11, verse 16, Peter was telling the sto that story. He was telling that story to the people who were trying to call him out for going to a Gentile. So he was telling that story. He was explaining what happened. He said, while I was talking, the Holy Spirit came on him. And then he said, I remembered the word of the Lord that said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Same event described as falling on and being baptized in. So how does this work? Well, let's rewind a little bit to water baptism and slow it down. When you're going under the water, right, you hit the water, the water splits, and you go in. Slow it down really slow. What happens then? The water comes on. It closes back over. So in the same event, you go into the water, but the water comes on you, right? Same thing. That's how it works. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you go in, he comes on. Same thing. Make sense? Okay. All right. I had a lot more verses to explain that, but you guys get it. It's the same thing. <laughs> Over it, the same events talked all the all through Scripture as either the Holy Spirit comes on, the Holy they get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then they throw a third one in there, receiving the Holy Spirit. All three talk about the same thing. They're interchangeable. Okay. You with me so far? So. The substance is the Holy Spirit. The repentance is this. Now that you know about it, will you receive it? In Acts chapter 19, verse 2, Paul talking to a group of people who were water baptized. They believed in Jesus because they heard John talk about him. They were water baptized. And then Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, we haven't heard about it. <laughs> and so Paul goes on to explain. Can we keep going over that chapter? Go to verse 3. He said, whoa, look what he's asking. See, in verse 2 he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They said, we didn't know about it. He said, well, then what were you, which baptism did you receive? <laughs> what baptism were you baptized? They said, John's baptism, water. Okay, verse 4. He says, John baptized with baptism of repentance, saying people should, people, <laughs> saying to the people that they should believe on him who is to come after him, that is on Jesus. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, and when Paul laid his hands on him, the Holy Spirit came on them. See, what happened was Paul explained to them about this gift of the Holy Spirit, and they didn't do what a lot of Christians today do. A lot of Christians today say, I don't need that. They said, we don't know about it. And when they found out about it, they said, yeah, okay. We'll take it. <laughs> right? The repentance is, you need to understand, you need something more. Because you and Jesus, just being saved, is not enough. You need, you need this next step. Okay? Okay? You need more than merely as if it was a, a small thing, but you need more than just being saved, being born again. is only the first step, right? Are you aware that you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit? See, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be witnesses, right? Jesus talking to some good brothers, he said, you need more. Yeah, I know, I know, you believe in me, but there's more. Okay? That power comes not when you're born again, but when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay? So the death, what is the death involved in this? The death is you will no longer be your own. See, in the water baptism, it's your old nature that dies. In the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's your self-will. It's what you want. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, 
Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the Spirit. These are the mature sons of God, right? The idea is when you go under the Holy Spirit, I guess, if you, when you go into the Holy Spirit, when you're baptized in him, the thing that stays there is your right to control your own life. Because Acts 1.8, again, I keep going back to this, but I guess this is the, kind of the key verse. In Acts 1.8, he says, you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Witnesses to me. New, New International says, you will be my witnesses. In other words, you're giving up your rule over your life. You become spirit-led. That's important because, honestly, that's what brings you into this is you realize, hey, I thought I had it all together, but obviously I need something else, and I'm willing to submit to whatever he says. That's the first step. Well, that is the first step of a spirit-led life. Okay? You with me so far, guys? You good so far? Okay. So, in this death, your self-will goes down underneath the the spirit and becomes just as dead as your old life no longer are you controlled by yourself you need to be like you were talking about today what seems good to the holy spirit what do you want me to do today what do you want me to say today okay now we get to the faith the faith involved here it can be seen in luke chapter 11 verse 13 it says this if you then being evil know how to give good gifts oh i'll let you catch up luke chapter 11 verse 13 if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? This is where your faith comes in. Do you believe he meant what he said here? Will he give it to you if you ask? It. Will you give him, give the Holy Spirit, if you ask him? Will he do it? He said he would. If you believe that, that brings you to your next response. Ask him. <laughs> After you ask in faith, take hold of Jesus' promise, and then you've got to act on your faith. Do you believe he meant what he said? He's going to give it to those who ask. Yes. Did you ask? Yes. Now what are you going to do about it? Because in the book of Acts, there's something that happened in every single baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Acts 10, 46. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Acts 19, 6. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Speaking in tongues is not all there is to being baptized in the Holy Spirit. But in Scripture, it is usually the first thing, the first thing that happens. You asked, right? Yep. You believed he said what meant what he said? Yep. Now what are you going to do about it? This is where your faith comes in. You've got to take the step of faith. You got to open your mouth. Remember I said you didn't get the right, you no longer have the right to control your own life. It starts with your tongue. Open your mouth and speak. In faith. Because he said in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, the Spirit gave them utterance. So you do it. You do it in faith. You say, okay, Father, I asked you, I believe you, here goes. <laughs> <laughs> right? We, when I was talking to Pastor Bill about this last night, I, I said, I got a pretty good picture of this, a pretty good analogy of this. You know, we're talking about baptism, if we're talking about water. You ever seen kids at a lake walk out about waist high, and they're like, I don't want to go any further. I don't want to go any further. In the meantime, their, their brothers and sisters are swimming all around. Hey, come on. It's great. It's fine. It's good. And they're like, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. That's what I, I feel like 
that step of speaking in tongues is. It's like, I've gone as far as I want, and I, I'm not comfortable going any further. <laughs> but you got to take the plunge. You got to go under all the way. You with me so far? This is your act of faith. Remember, everything, every one of these baptisms involve an element of faith. This is your act of faith. Open your mouth and begin to speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit won't force you to say anything, and you probably will not know anything that you're about to say before you say it. But if you start speaking in faith, trusting that God will do what he said, he will give you the Holy Spirit when you ask. Okay, so now we get to the good part. So we talked about the substance, which is the Holy Spirit. We talked about the repentance, which is you understand you need this now. We talked about the death where you die to your self-will and surrender to his control, right? We talked about the act of faith, which is you believe that he did what he said he was going to do, and you received the Holy Spirit, and you start speaking in tongues. Now we get to number five the resurrection, which is awesome in this one. Back to Acts 1.8, you will receive what? Power. Going back to Ephesians 1, it is the power that raised him from the dead that now works in you. Okay? This is the power to be a witness. Okay? Okay? So when your self-will dies under the Holy Ghost, you'll be raised up to a supernatural, supernatural life. When your natural you dies, something supernatural comes up. This is exactly what happened to Jesus. After he was baptized, Luke 4, 14, he was baptized, he was led into the Spirit, and then after that, he says, he returned in the power of the Spirit. Acts 10.38 agrees with this. It says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and what? Power. Say the Holy Spirit and power. This is the same Holy Spirit in Acts 10, the same Holy Spirit in Acts 1, when he said you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So if it's the same Holy Spirit in both verses, would it not be the same power in both, both verses? I believe so. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 10.38, God anointed Jesus from Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. When you're raised out of this baptism, you're raised into a new spirit-empowered life. This is where you start doing things that Jesus did. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Jesus said, I don't do anything unless I see my father do it. I don't say anything unless I hear my father say it. Would you say that is a spirit-led life? And what did it lead to? It led to power. Right? It led to him raising the dead. It led to him healing the sick. It led to him calming storms, casting out demons. He did what he heard the father do, or, or saw the father do. He said what he heard the father say. He was led by the spirit, and it resulted in power. Would it be any different with us? It should not be. This is the power, this is the resurrection power that results from a spirit-led, spirit-filled life. Okay? John 14, 12 says this, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also in greater works than these because I go to my Father. Now what was significant about him going to the Father? Why did he go back? To send the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he says, you'll do greater works than these. You follow me so far? This is only available to someone who's been baptized in the Holy Spirit. All right? So I dare you to do this. I dare you to ask him, if you have not already. I may be talking to a uh, church of completely spirit-filled believers, and that would be great. Um, if you have not, I dare you to do it. Do you believe that he meant what he said? 
He will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So, when are you planning on doing that? <laughs> All right, you with me so far? Okay, let's go on to number three quickly, I think. Do we have time? Do we have time? No, we do not. Okay, I'll hit this next time. The third baptism, we'll hit it next time. I don't want to skimp out on it because some of you may actually be going through it right now, and I don't want to, you know, I want to give you some good instructions, not rush it, okay? Stand up. Pastor Bill, you got anything? No? Okay. Well, I, you know, I don't really feel led to actually do this up here. I don't know. But I will suggest this. If you have not asked, do that when you go home. Don't let this message settle and the urgency of it go away. And you go home and you forget about it. I, if I were you, do this on your own. I would go home and I would ask, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Baptize me in the Holy Ghost. And then take the step in faith and start praying. Father, in the name of Jesus, I am grateful for what you have done for us. I'm thankful for this foundation you're laying in our life. Lord, it is a sure foundation built on the rock of your word. And when we get these things in place, no storm that the world can throw against us will knock us over. I'm grateful for it, Father. Thank you that we have been baptized into death with you raised to a new life, empowered by grace to live righteously, <laughs> baptized in the Holy Ghost with a prayer language that prays exactly in line with your word, gets results, the power to be a witness, the power to live victoriously. Lord, is it any wonder that we can say, if God is for us, who can be against us? What you did for us just in these two baptisms as uncomfortable as they may have been we've been raised to a new life thank you for it we give you praise in Jesus name everyone says Amen. all right love you guys